There is no wilderness in Ireland. Our mountain landscape has been worked by humans for many thousands of years, and none more so than the coolies. The human record is visible throughout the mountains. Great burial cairns on the summits, ancient crop ridges and ring forts on the lower slopes, ruins of bully huts in the river glens. Through the turf fields and the forests we can follow the stone walls built as relief works in the Great Famine, and occasionally we can find the lazy beds where people grew potatoes and corn. The mountains bear other, less tangible traces of human activity. The generations who walked and worked these hills described and named the places they use, creating a rich landscape of place names. And Cage and Strabra and Anna War. These names in English and in the local dialect of Irish are still used by sheep farmers who graze the slopes. Well, we are really an army, a maravillu, a really a natsachiella gondi luye, a gus maravillu, she gondi a dun, a gus a gondi artwaka homai, kana wancher le, a vion and show gilic eriela, mara germa de sela lenisha, no gilic erish cart allu. They also tell the story of the mountains giving us a glimpse into how our forebears used and understood and these places. People have been using the mountains for over 5,000 years for a wide variety of activities, from burying their dead in the case of the great Neolithic um, passage tombs off Claremont and Kernawadi, to grazing animals, which has been a hugely important activity through the millennia, to hunting, to cutting turf, um, and of course there's a route way across the mountains. Place names are really key to understanding how people have made meaning in this landscape. They're sort of like a communally made mental map of the mountains. They point out important resources and places, so for example good grazing lands, um, good places for cutting turf, streams, boundaries, um, all the places that people found most important on the mountains. In the 19th century, the herring fisheries were thriving in Carlingford Lock, employing more than 200 fishermen in Omeath alone. The shortest route to market in Dundalk was over the mountains. Young girls and women carried fish wrapped in seaweed in creels, two stone apiece strapped to their backs. The inhabitants of this district eke out their subsistence by hawking fish through the country and are greatly looked down upon by their neighbours who say that the Omeath men are no better than peddlers and cadgers. They were known as cadgers, a Middle English word for peddlers, and the route they took is still called the cadgers pad. From Angara Ur, they climbed the southern flank of Tullet Glen crossing Da Owen and turning sharply above Mary Sluan, where the steep zigzag path on the Molly Wee took them on to Omarafada. It took more than an hour to climb to the ridge. In a shelter dipped by a stream, there is a large flat rock where they rested. Sometimes they played a game of cards there. This is Cluck Imoth and Agarty. But one day, when someone dealt the ace of spades, the devil appeared out of the mist on Omarafada, and no more cards were played on the rock. The herring fisheries declined from about 1870 onwards. There is just one photograph 
of an Omeath herring girl. This is Annie Flynn, the last cadger. The route remained important to Omeath long into the 20th century, for driving cattle to the fair or for selling of all kinds. The last Irish speaker, Annie O'Hanlon, told what it meant to her. It wasn't unusual in the old times, when I was young, for a woman or a girl to throw a bag of hens on her back and walk from here to Dundalk, over the mountain, out the cadger's pad to sell them. That would be a Christmas time that was common. Before there was silage, before modern haymaking, there was bullying. Moving all the cattle and a lot of the people to mountain pastures for several months every summer. The importance of bullying is shown by all the place names referring to grass and grazing. And Lena Moore. The Lenny Moore comes from Lena, meaning a grassy place, and there are many versions in the coolies. And Lena Keel. The main bullying site for Omeath was in Tullad Glen. This is what we call a Mari. It's Mari Tanamuk. Um, this is where people would have came, young people mostly would have came and lived here from May to September, minding cattle on the hills. There's um, various Maris here, various place names in this area. When I was collecting the place names of the local people, they were telling me about Mari Tanamuk, Mari Dowie, Mari Sloan, Mari Ukna Criddy. Every spring, the walls of the Bully Hut were built up again and the hut was roofed with scraws top sods of heather cut from the mountainside. The door opening in a bully always faces south or southeast for light because there were no window openings. Before the famine, there might have been a hundred or more people here at midsummer and a few hundred livestock. The cattle were penned close to the bully at night for milking, but during the day the young people drove them high onto the ridges to graze. When I was collecting the place names in this area, I realised that there was um, the last of the dialect, the Irish Gaelic dialect, was, was still alive in the place names in these hills. Vardini Aru Agelic Shaw Aku Ruan Hanaman Shaw Aku Aganter Ame, Stoilamse and Dian Slager and Dian Jerry, then Gaelic and Ur and Ur Yeshkart, although I guess an Ur in the head and Vidini Kossel Anabani Anluan, Pedro Sluan, I guess Mershin Dedi, Dini Roa Gaelic Aku is Nashaskati, I guess Fuens Nashaklati, I guess Bedzig Rodini Aro Aurain Aku in the Yeshin. It was bullying which gave the Cooley Mountains so many Gaelic place names. Canawan Charlie, a V on. Rubbo Cossel Gaelic Vannon, Rubbo Cossel Gaelic Hir Honel, Maratashi, and you. A stylum son rud the Suntasi when Hanawan shot na and fuckle ha. Session in that near Rome, I guess near me, mar a old meter or a skull on you, Gerardini, ha Rome, a hanel me, I guess Marchende, I guess Scarbation, Candon the Treche is larger, I guess the Suntasi, a view in St. Hanawan. Women and girls played a prominent role in the bully, milking and churning butter for sale. The men and boys were tending crops on the lowland farms, or fishing, or on the tramp for work on the big farms north or south. That wooded area is Trumpet Hill. Cúchulainn had his camp down at the base of the hill. The first and greatest story told in Ireland was on Tánbó the cattle raid of Cúlí. 
It's a true epic, a fictional story of a search for the brown ball of Cooley, but it is probably based on some real events that happened 2,000 years ago. And behind the hill on the shore, Queen Maeve's army was camped down by Belurgan. Every morning, Cúhollin sent his trumpeter to the top of the hill to blow out a challenge to the Connacht men to send out a champion to fight him. And every day at noon, they met at the ford on the Flurry River at Ballymascanlan in single combat. Just over the hill there is the Ballymacellet River and there's a deep gorge on it that we call on Dukhara, the Black Cauldron. That's where the Cooley men hid the bull from Queen Maeve and the armies of Connacht. But when all the fighting in Glenmore was over, the Connacht men found the bull quietly grazing with its heifers up there at the Bronze Age fort of Lissachig. This valley has many layers of human traces. Lysachigil was already old when Queen Maeve's armies came through. The name means Fort of the Rye, and rye may have been one of the crops grown on ancient ridges, very like lazy beds, that are under the heather and sometimes under turf. Archaeologists have found traces of early medieval occupation and there is some evidence that 18th century rapparees or rebels moulded musket balls here. In recent centuries, the Bully huts were built using remains of Bronze Age huts. The patches of bright green on the Bully sites across the slopes up towards Karnawadi are the result of centuries of cow dung. Like neighbouring townlands in Omeath, Glenmore was a functioning Gaeltacht into the 20th century. We're here in Cronknamona, and this used to be known as O'Neillsville, because at one stage there was at least seven O'Neill uh, names in this area. And the Glenmore surnames came from Armagh, Cavan and Tyrone, and the names being McGeown, Donnelly, O'Neills, O'Hanlons, Toners, O'Rourke's, Rooney's, McCann's, and my own maiden name, O'Reilly. Glenmore was part of the estate acquired by Elizabethan adventurer Nicholas Bagnall, but early estate papers list no residence. It seems to have been used mainly for bullying by lowland farmers until the mid-17th century, when people, dispossessed by war and plantation to the north, began to arrive. These were the people who put names on the mountain pastures. In the 1800s, all of the Glenmore people would have spoken Irish, but by 1900, the only people who spoke Irish were those from birth. And the last native speaker here was Nancy O'Neill, who died in 1932. <laughs> A hillu, Kili and Shashin got Dosni and she a file wash. Agus Gigaro, Shanley, ni bedger a bunch, you say jas and relega, Galehol Gaji, Nanijek Fihiji, Agus Nanijek Trahaji, Nero, a relega, a lord's more hang of football, a hillu, Agus Nero, she a lord Lapashi, a hillu, Agus the rare killer for she boss. This area is known as the Monches and you can see the old stone walls here. These, these are old homesteads where people lived uh, a couple of hundred years ago. 
and an old man told me that he heard that there was 40 families over here uh, and they would have uh, they would have walked this land you can see the ridges down there and there's more ridges over there and they would have walked this land and uh, grew potatoes at the time of the famine the largest landowner in county Louth was thomas fortescue of ravensdale later lord claremont who held over 23,000 acres. He wanted to clear the Moncha for grazing. 60 years ago, folklore collectors heard how he got rid of the tenants. There were 40 families here before the famine, but the landlord claimed them all to raise bullocks on it. Lord Claremont put the people out. It was him, surely. He put them out in this way. He gave them a pound and paid their fare to America. Neil McGeown was the last to leave the Muncha. I heard him saying, McGeown used to say, after he was put out, I left me mountain, me lime and me land, all to be obedient to your honour. It's great to see that, you know, that they're still here, these old walls, a couple of hundred years on, and it was great that they weren't bulldozed away, and it'd be, it'd be a shame to, if anything ever happened to them, you know and uh, the reminder to us all of our people that went before us and uh, we should never forget them, you know. Uh, the Lord of mercy in them all. It's Rod an Hawatach ar Nairacht agus is Bralom a Hickel Gawil Sim Moore, Egg Nadini, a Conian, Sa Cantor Shaw, Sa Cooley, Sa Cheerdrach, Sa Steyer, Sa Cantor, Agus, Sa Logan Amnacha, and Awil in Uzat Gufoil, Lish na, na Farmiori. It's a uh, Rod Iantaka Heckel Gawil and Togra, Ayrach the Shaw Janta, Egg and Dini Shaw, Agus. Tasulog and Gowil, Gomeshirig, they'll go, um, go bra, uh, go tohi. These place names have a story to tell. It's the story of the men and the women who dug the land and they carried fish, the milk cows, the churn butter, and the built famine walls. They were our ancestors and they've left a legacy in the place names. We should treasure that legacy, not for their sake, but for our own, because it's our story and it makes us who we are.